so today i mean is our second class uh, uh today we are going to i mean learn about uh, the key principle of hadoop so from the last class we know we there are two components hdfs and mapreduce so this class is mainly i mean uh, based on how this hdfs and mapreduce will work so it's it's fully theory from next class onwards i mean we can start uh, uh, preparing sdfs clusters and use uh, mapreduce in in i mean in our lab so what i i mean understand from the i mean the organizing committee so there are a couple of new members uh, who are joining from this class so just i mean a short recap what we cover in last uh, discussion uh, so we covered around few topics uh, what is big data and how big is big data what the problem what are the problem we are trying to solve so we understand that we are trying to solve mainly two problems one is uh, how we can store large amount of data and how we can process large amount of data within an efficient and effective cost model and we also went through some basic data structure what are the data types different type of structure exist in the real world so we understand there are structured semi structured and non structured data and we'll also go through some basic hadoop principles today so i'm not repeating here and history of hadoop we can also have a review and why i mean rdms in some time i mean relational database management system is not uh, efficient to handle large amount of data that that we discussed earlier and we also discussed about the hadoop ecosystem there are many tools which we might need to use to solve a particular problem and how we can download hadoops what are the best plays and what different kind of vendors are doing by i mean accumulating core hadoops tools so today we are going to i mean cover this uh, four topics only uh, sdfs concept sdfs detail architecture how it works and we are going to start i mean understanding the distributed computing framework mapreduce and and how it works under the hood so as i said that hadoop has two component one is sdfs and another is mapreduce so sdfs uh is basically a distributed file system and it stores large amount of data in distributed way i mean in cluster of commodity machines so one of the advantages of hadoop or laptop and desktop but also not the state of the art machines i mean which are expensive and the initial i mean uh the research and also how how do comes it is basically started from google so so when google primarily faced the problem to search users interested data from large amount of i mean websites which they indexed in their database from there they are searching a solution so they have built gfs google file system and on top of that they are using mostly all of their solutions nowadays so after that it becomes part of apache gradually so so that is story i mean if you missed the first class you can go through the slides and 
I believe you can understand how it comes to open source community and how it is evolving now. Similarly, the MapReduce is, is part of basically that study. I mean, that also invented by Google and now it's part of uh, open source community under Hadoop. So it's one of the important component which is solving the distributed computing and it's just a framework. So now <clears throat> let's say this is basically today's topic. So we are going to start the one of the component Hadoop distributed file system. So, so there are some key principles based on uh, that the Hadoop whole system is designed. So we'll go through the importance features of that. The primary assumptions and goal of Hadoop SDFS design, number one is hardware failure. So as we are using, I mean, a lot of commodity machines in our cluster, and those are not having, uh, I mean, some redundant features that we generally get used to some state of the art machines. So that means the failures is common. So whenever we are storing large amount of data or either we are, I mean, processing large amount of data, the hardware failure will be common. A RAM can be failed, a DIX can be failed. I mean, CPU core cannot be, I mean, workable in some point of time. So that we need to handle so that the user data is kept always, I mean, accessible and reliably stored. Number second is streaming data access. So nowadays, the data velocity is also one of the key important part. I mean, one each large amount of data and how fast data is coming, which we might need to process to solve a different use cases. So HDFS is also designed to cater that specific requirement. And third one we already know is, is built to handle large data files and large data sets. And the, the fourth one is very important that HDFS applications needs a write once, read many. So this is one thing that is, 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 is it's a bit tricky to understand because generally when we write something on one database, we used to update many times as we need. But this model is saying that it's, it's preferable and the design principle is we'd, we'd write once and we'd read from the data whatever time we need. But it's not effective for a use case or we need to update the data set more and more and more, then it will create inefficiencies. So we'll, we'll create file, we'll append file, that's fine, we'll read file, fine. But overriding the existing files, if it's certain percentage is okay, but if we are doing in a large percentage level, then Hadoop may not be the right solution. And moving computation is cheaper than moving data. So that's what, I mean, we discussed. So in the traditional processing, I mean, the model, what we do, we have an application in backend, we have database. So generally the logic will be applied to certain uh, data, which can be accessed uh, from a database and we took the data set, we apply our logic, we process it, make some output, and return back to the database again. This is traditional model. But here, we are, what we are doing as we are, I mean, distributing our data in multiple blocks to multiple cluster nodes. So whenever we are also running a job using MapReduce, so there might be possibility if we follow a standard, then the jobs is running with the data that is inside the machine. So data does not need to be, I mean, transferred to the network to a master node, it's not necessary always. So that is another advantage. And portability across heterogeneous hardware and software platform. So we know, I mean, Hadoop 
uh, works in different operating systems and hardware. But for production, it's always recommended to be run on, I mean, Linux kernel. Linux or Linux kernel. So in the, in the picture, I mean, if you see this, uh, there are multiple racks and this rectangular box, you can consider a specific nodes. Uh, those are running as a data nodes because in the SDFS, there are two components. One is name nodes, another is data nodes. So we'll know, I mean, more about what is name node and what is data node and how it works. Just for the time being, I mean, in the data nodes, these are the small rectangular blocks. These are the data that client, I mean, is keeping within the data nodes. And the name node, if you see, it is not keeping any data blocks, but it is tracking for a particular file. And within a file, there might be multiple data blocks and how these data blocks are distributed across different data nodes that is being tracked by name node. So we'll, we'll, I mean, go through in details with an example so that you can understand how it works more detail in the next slides. So, I mean, coming to SDFS uh, architecture, how it looked like. So we, we just want to run a command or we want to programmatically access the SDFS cluster, whatever, we are, we are saying that portion as applications. So definitely whenever we are trying to access SDFS cluster, there, there should be a client protocol that has to be maintained. I mean, whenever we are running a command, so we need to maintain that command syntax and from a specific shell, we need to run that command. Or if we, not, if we need to access the SDFS using Python or Java, so we need to understand what protocols they implemented and how to connect with that particular SDFS cluster. So that is, I mean, that we are referring as a client protocol. And in ideally, this SDFS is, as we know, is a cluster system. So it's a master-slave architecture. In the master-slave architecture, there are fundamentally two types of nodes. Nodes can be, I mean, uh, 10, 100, depending on the cluster size. But there are two types of nodes. One is name node and another is data node. What is name node? So the name node is basically managing the file system. What does it mean? The name node is keeping track of all the files and directories that are placed in HDFS. And also it is keeping how these, these file blocks are distributed across different data nodes. So this is high level. So it, that means the name nodes is storing metadata. So we all know, I mean, the metadata is standard terminology. So the data is data. So that is metadata. So the user's data are actually being stored in data nodes across different platforms. Here we, we have shown, I mean, data node one, two, and it can up to N. You can put N as an arbitrary number. So if your cluster is two, three, so the data node will be three. and Within the name node also, if it's, uh, you can also configure data node. But here in this diagram, we configured these nodes is having one that name node is running and some three different servers or virtual machines is running three different data nodes. In the name node, so there are two important files. One is FS image. So these files, his main responsibility is to keep track of the directories and file is created within this SDFS clusters. And the edit log is continuously tracking all the changes which has been made on files. And moreover, the name nodes is tracking the, the user's 
access matrix so that whenever client is accessing a particular directory or files so the name node will be checking whether the file is available or the file is is i mean the user has the access to to particular files or not so all these being checked by the name nodes now coming to data nodes so the name nodes is is communicating with data nodes with a particular port that we'll see i mean when we do the lab so the name node upon request from the user it can be read it can be write the name node will request to data node either to store the specific blocks of file or to i mean give the specific block to the name node if it's a read i mean read request so if it's a read request or write request from the client it will be transferred to the data node because the actual blocks of the user will be stored in the data node and the data node also proactively notify the name nodes i mean specific files blocks are stored in this place or that place that information is proactively sent to name node from the data node and the data node also perform block creation deletion and replication instruction from the name node so we will see i mean how the the replications will work so in this architecture if you understand on a higher level i understand there are still queries so we'll be clarifying it with an example but what what is the problem in this architecture so one problem i have in mind that for example in this architecture if data node one is having number of blocks and if it is down then how can we retrieve those blocks from other data nodes right so that's why if you see there is a point replication so whenever user is putting a file the name node first will check i mean whether this file is having same name in the same directory so that it's not creating duplicacy and user access to create a file or not and then it will i mean create some blocks from the file data and those blocks will be distributed to data nodes that is understandable but those blocks will be replicated across the cluster that is important because if the replication factor is 2 that means one block will be kept at least in two different data nodes if the replication factor is 3 that means the blocks one single block will be replicated to three data nodes so this is the way we can i mean still keep the data safe if there is any data node fail or even two data nodes are failed so if it, if it is okay then we understand the data node level maybe we ensure our redundancy but what happen if the name node is down because in this architecture the name node is single so since hadoop uh, version 2 so this is a big limitation of hadoop so before hadoop version 2 when the people are using i mean hadoop in uh, in production systems so they do some kind of automations by themselves on top of hadoop so that the name node redundancy is managed but after hadoop second i mean 2 dot something so now apache is supporting name node cluster in active standby mode so that if one name node is down then subsequent secondary name node can take over the role and ensure the sdfs access to the applications or client smoothly so if we if we i mean configure the name nodes i mean secondary nodes in a cluster mode that will ensure i mean if there is something wrong with the name node active name node still we will get the service
I am I just I mean observing a lot of questions still so I will answer all the questions uh, after the session So I mean if we go I mean at deep uh, breath to I mean how the read operation or write operations are the two fundamental operations. So there are other operations like delete and and others in a file system. But we'll see. I mean, for a Hadoop file system, how we read operations is work, and how the write operation is work. So for the read operations. If we see that there is an SDFS client, it can be initiated from a shell or can be initiated programmatically that is trying to read a specific file kept in a location in SDFS. So whenever the client request is coming to SDFS, this request will have related system calls. So you are seeing some open, read, close. So these these are, I mean, all system calls known in Linux Unix system. So whenever, if you are familiar with uh, some Linux command like copy, ls, and move, mb, right? So these are shell commands whenever we are running. So I don't know that if anyone is having any experience to see this command code written in C. So you will understand that there are a lot of system calls being used to, to ensure that whenever the users is running those commands, these commands initially converted into system calls. And on top of that, after that, it will run on the Linux kernel. So here also, I mean, whenever there is a read request, so first, it will try to open the file before reading. It will try to open the file. Then SDFS will check with name note that whether the file is exist or not. And as I said, the user has the permission to view that specific file. And then it will send a request to, to specify or identify the blocks of those specific file. It, everything's OK. The name node will send all this block. And then the SDFS will send requests to data nodes that please give me the blocks of files that have been requested to you. So then the data node will send and respond to the read request and send all the particular blocks under, I mean, the file data input stream. So if you work with, I mean, uh, input output stream in Java or any other language. So you know you may be familiar with the term. So under this input stream, it will revert back the specific blocks to SDFS and then SDFS will send the response to client. And after that, it will close the connection for the file read operation. So this is, I mean, the high level flow, how a client can communicate to SDFS for a file read and internally how it works. Hope this is clear. If uh, you have any questions, please write down. We'll still recap after the session. Uh, we'll have a dedicated at least 15 to 20 minutes just to clarify you have any question or not. So the next one is uh, is the right operation. I mean, we see how uh, the read operation works in terms of uh, write operation. That means that user wants to create a file, wants to write some data into the file. Then the SDFS client will create internally a create request to the SDFS. And SDFS, as usual, it will check in the specific locations, is there any uh, name which is duplicating what the user is asking to create a file? 
output stream, FS that I have stream to return to the client so that the client can start writing that file blocks into that. As soon as it is, I mean, receiving the data blocks, the data blocks will be distributed into the data node and keep in mind that what is the replication received a file from a client we know what is the hdfs basic block size let's say our hdfs block size is 64 megabytes so i said in my last class that the hdfs block size is far large larger than any normal operating system that we use for example in linux this can be 4k to 64k but in SDFS, the minimum is 64 megabyte. But in general, in production, it is used to 128 and 256 megabyte. So for example, if it's 64 megabyte and the user file is more than that, we create blocks. And before writing blocks to the data nodes, we'll see configuration that what is the replication factor. If it is three, will at least one block will be written in three data nodes and revert back to client when all the blocks are written. And then it will close the connection. So this is the way, I mean, the SDFS will, client will communicate with SDFS nodes and all this information, the blog information, finally it will be stored in name node. I think something wrong with my video. Let me start again. Sorry, it's not starting. I am still continuing, I mean, with audio. So this is one example, I mean, which will, uh, I mean, clarify your doubts if you have any Confusion. For example, we have a text file which is around uh, 130 megabyte, and we configure our Hadoop default block size is 64 MB. So, whenever we are trying to keep a particular file, 130 MB file in SDFS, then the name node will try to split it in multiple blocks. Let's say block one, block two, and block three. Block one will be 64 MB, block two will be 64 MB, and block three will be two megabytes. So if we sum it up, it will be around 130 megabytes. These blocks will be stored in data nodes. So if we have one name node and three data nodes, that means we need to store these blocks across three data nodes because the user's file blocks will be stored only in the data nodes. Now, we need to see what is the replication factor. Here we consider the replication factor is two. That means one single box will be written in at least two data nodes. If we see the B1 is stored in data node one and data node three. B2 is stored in data node one and data node two. B3 is stored in data node two and data node three. So it's, it's, it's now the question is, I mean, how, so let's say in data node one, we have 100 gig capacity, data node two is a 100 gigabyte capacity, data node three is a 100 gigabyte capacity. How do, I mean, will try to write all this block thinking there should be a balance, consum balance consumption of the data nodes so that a particular data node is not over consuming the spaces. Okay. So to make sure that, so we'll see in our practical session that there is a command how to balancer. So if in operational situation, if we see this, some of the data nodes, the consumption rate is high. If we run how to balance command, then it will automatically try to reshuffle the blocks across the data nodes and it will notify the name nodes. So that, I mean, almost an equal amount of storage are consumed in across data nodes. So this is also possible. 
i hope now you can understand is a very simple technique how the pile can be splitted in multiple blocks and seeing the replication factor how it will be distributed in multiple nodes of course data nodes and name nodes is keeping the metadata and it's not storing any user file blocks so name node is a function please don't mix up the name node is an operating system no in an operating system we can run name node and data node so the whenever we are running a specific os with the name node that means in that os the name node is running but for lab purpose i mean uh, i saw many many person can run name nodes with an data node there is no issue but in a production system generally we run name node dedicatedly and there is no name node data node install where we install basically name node the name node is kept separated from other nodes but in development purpose or lab purpose we can still install data nodes in uh, with along with the name nodes in the same operating system i mean just to understand i mean i am am i going very fast or i should go i mean a bit slow so this is uh, i mean a tricky uh, topic uh, it it will be helpful whenever Uh, you are trying to design your own uh, SDFS cluster, SDFS. How to sizing the SDFS is very important. I mean, for example, I I try to consider that for a particular application, we'll be getting, let's say, daily one gigabyte, one hundred gigabytes of data. Now, how? for my company or my business i can create one sdfs considering certain parameters i mean how how we need to decide the sizing of the sdfs when i'm saying sizing what does it mean it means how many nodes we would need to run and what are those nodes resource capacity when i say resource it means within a node how many ram cpu hard disk network bandwidth all these details has to be captured so as it is mostly related with the disk storage so we will more focus on storage portion for sdfs side and later we we'll see for a generic case or medium or large configuration how the ram cpu and network bandwidth are related and what are the recommendations so as we said i mean daily input for a particular application is 100 gigabyte for example and for the cluster or the business requirement and from our experience we try to consider the sdfs rectification factor is 3 that means whenever we are putting a small log that will be stored in three data nodes so this is a plain calculation so so the storage capacity to store a 100 gb should be 300 gb primarily right and if you consider a growth 5% growth each month then the overall capacity of a one month data it will be around 9450 gb right and if you calculate for one year it's around uh 16971 gb just a mathematical calculation so for a month just for the time being think about for a month it's around 9450 gb 
if we consider a monthly growth of 5% because in any application generally it, it should have a growth. Now what else will be there out of the SDFS data? So the SDFS will be coming with an operating system. So if we, if we have a disk storage and within the disk storage, first we need to install the OS, right? And if we also need to run MapReduce job, I mean distributed computing, if we need to run, then we, not, we need to keep some storage for that purpose. So let's say intermediate MapReduce data, we are considering 25%. And non SDFS reserve space per disk. Let's consider 30%. So 55%. So if we take one hard drive per node and the hard drive size is 4 terabyte, so from 2 terabyte, we need to, I mean, deduct around 55% of the space, which is not directly used by the SDFS. So the usable space will be 1.8 terabytes. So now if we need to calculate how many data nodes at least you need, just thinking about the first month, it will be 9.450 divided by 1800. I mean 1.8, it should be 1.8 because it's already converted to terabyte, this one. So it should be 1.8, it will be around six nodes. So if we need to create at least six data nodes and each data nodes will be having four terabytes of hard disk. From there, basically we're using 45% of the disk space for the HDFS and it will support you for the replication factor of three. And also it will support you to store your daily 100 GB, including the 5% monthly growth. So I believe it's, it's very simple calculation. So, I mean, if you need for any production case, you also can calculate and, and see how many, actually how many data nodes you would need and what will be the uh, parameters that you need to consider before sizing your SDFS cluster. Now, uh, I mean, coming to uh, the other parameters, because the storage parameter is more critical to understand, but the memory, CPU, and network bandwidth, is comes, it comes with some standard, I mean, for productions. Uh, it's fell from many industries and Hadoop, Apache Hadoop. So, Let's say for name node memory, uh, we would, I mean the OS, which is hosting the name node process. So in case of medium, it medium cluster, it should be around two gigabyte of uh, memory. And for large clusters, it should be four gigabyte. And if we install any secondary name node and for a large cluster or medium cluster, to make sure the SDFS is accessible if there is something wrong in name node. So we also need to plan for secondary name node as the same RAM capacity, which is recommended. And we also need to keep our, I mean, separate some memory for operating system. We all know on top of all these distributed machines, we are running SDFS on top of the base OS. So for base OS, based on the specific OS that we are using, four to eight gigabits of RAM we need to keep. And HDFS memory. So this is for HDFS. And the core component of the HDFS, for this we'll keep two gigabyte to eight gigabytes. So if we just, uh, to calculate, I mean, the minimum number of memory for a production name node, it should be two, 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 and four equal to eight GB. 
So the second component, which is secondary name node memory, that has been deducted because it's a separate node. So other than if you plus two, uh, plus four, plus two, it would be around eight GB. And what about the data node? Data nodes is is so basically the data nodes is giving all the responses of the read, write, delete, whatever operations on top of user data blocks is being performed the data nodes. So the data nodes processing memory should be much higher than name node. So data node processing process memory should be around 4 GB to 8 GB. And it, it has a relation with the CPU core. For example, in a specific data node, if you install four physical core, I mean unit physical core, then you need to assign 4 GB per core. And if your cluster is running the map reduce, then the data node will be running one more process. We'll know under map reduce all these details. Task tracker memory. So that will be from 4 GB to 8 GB. And same here in the data node. We are running on top of a host OS. So the OS memory should be around 4 GB to 8 GB. And CPU core, it should be minimum 4 core plus. So nowadays, I mean, we are seeing all the CPU, physical CPU. It is having multiple cores, at least four cores. Then at least one physical core should be assigned to a specific data nodes. And memory per core should be 4 GB. So at least for a data node memory, we are seeing if we are using four core, four into four, plus processing data node processing memory, plus OS memory, all including around 28 GB for a production instance of data node to ensure uh, best performance and is considering we are running MapReduce on top of this HDFS. So if someone is not running MapReduce, then you can exclude the data node tax tracker memory, which is not being used. And it's, it's only required if you are running MapReduce. And in terms of, I mean, network throughput, so within the rack, it's recommended the data throughput, the network throughput should be around 10 gigabit per, per second. So, so this is, I mean, uh, covering the overall, if you are trying to design a SDFS cluster, what should be the name node and data node numbers and how we need to calculate the disk storage and also how we need to decide about the memory, CPU, and network bandwidth. So it's not that uh, if you are not maintaining all the standards, it will not run, but it's recommended for a production cluster. So these are the some commands. Uh, of SDFS access. So if you are familiar with Linux, you would get some familiarity. I mean, for example, you want to create a directory, which is foodier. So you just need to run a command in your SDFS, Hadoop, DFS, MKDR, and then foodier. It will be created on the root file system of SDFS. As I place slash foodier, so the MKDR is a known common syntax to create a folder in a Linux or Unix machine. So that is being, I mean, followed in this common syntax as well. But you need to put Hadoop and DFS before that. So then it will try to connect to the SDFS and create that specific directory. So if you need to remove it, it's it's the same DFS. RM common, and then if you need to create, create or read, uh, we generally know is a cat statement. Using that, we can, I mean, read a file uh, in a Linux Unix system, so it's the same. So only the difference is you need to add Hadoop TFS, 
and then you can almost use the normal Linux or Unix systems uh, syntax to file operations. So these are some administrative commands. I mean, uh, if something goes wrong, sometimes uh, some unreliability happen. So, so the Hadoop file system automatically went to the safe mode. So how we need to enable, disable the safe mode, here are some commands. And let's say we configure one Hadoop file system. We want to see how many data nodes, what are the blocks. So we need to give Hadoop PFS admin report command. We'll see when in the next class uh, how these commands output will be. And it's very common that we have currently 100 data nodes out of that two data nodes are not functioning well. So we need to decommission or you need to recommission or you need to, I mean, add one data node. So these are, I mean, common activity that any system administrator of SDFS should follow regularly. So whenever we are adding or removing or recommissioning any existing data node also, then we need to run these DFS admin refresh nodes. So we'll see, I mean, I don't want to discuss more on this, but just, uh, just for you, I mean, thought purpose, I shared this so that you can understand how it relates to existing, I mean, Linux, Unix commands to access the DFS files. And if you see the, there are some limitations of Hadoop. So one we already discussed, write once, treat multiple times. It does not mean that it is not allowing us at all to rewrite a file system or an existing file. But if we do it, I mean, a certain percentage level over, then it will create inefficiencies because it's not been designed to do so. And uh, so we all know about hard links and soft links. If not it's relatable, then I think you create shortcuts in Windows. So it's, it's like, I mean, soft link and hard links is related to the shortcuts that we create in Windows OS for a folder of files type. So these are not supported yet. And user's quota, I mean, in Linux, Unix, or whatever file system in Windows, if you create a user and we can allow the user to consume a certain amount of blocks or storage capacity, let's say three gigabytes or something. So which is not yet been implemented uh, in Hadoop. And this is Hadoop name node is still a single instance, but yes, I mean, as we explained, uh, starting from Hadoop second version and onwards. So, if anyone wants to configure the name node clusters, that he can, I mean, configure multiple name nodes in active standby mode, so that if there is something wrong in the name node, uh, then if, if there is something wrong with the name node, it will, I mean, shift to the secondary name nodes. But what, what here we are trying to mean that at a time, there will be only one node, which will be managing the, all the data nodes in the clusters. So this, this is about the one of the component of uh, Hadoop, I mean Hadoop file system. So Hadoop has two components. One is SDFS and another is uh, MapReduce. So, we are closing the architecture, sizing, and concept discussion on the SDFS. And now we are moving forward to the MapReduce. So we know how we in a distributed format, we can store the user's data in SDFS. So this is about SDFS. And now how we can run a particular job in a distributed fashion. So that is, that is basically MapReduce. So what is MapReduce? The MapReduce uh, is basically a distributing framework, distribu distributed computing framework. Why we are saying the framework? 
So it has basically two components, map and reduce. So I don't want to, I mean, give some theoretical uh, explanation of map and reduce. It's, it's better to understand, I mean, in a practical form so that we can relate. And why it's framework? Because the users or programmers can define based on the use case how the map will work and how the reduce will work. So that's why it's a framework. And it's a distributed computing framework, which will ensure your job will be running in multiple machines. And someone will be here to accumulate all the outputs and give it to the client. So in this MapReduce architecture, so it is also a master slave mode like the HDFS because the, the principle is same here. But how it works is a, it should be different because it's not part of storage, it's part of computations. So application will be communicating with MapReduce master node. And generally, the master node will be posting the job tracker. And the job tracker responsibility is to accept the job from the applications and understand the instruction given by users and, and then create multiple taxes from the job and distribute those taxes to the slave nodes and receives the output from the slave nodes, combining it, reducing it, and giving result to the applications. So that is the job for the job tracker, which is managed by the master. So here, if you see in the master node, we are running one task tracker. That means the operating system is hosting both master and slave. And the slave nodes will only host the task tracker. If you see the underlining blue nodes, these are slave nodes and they are hosting only task tracker. That means they are receiving tasks from the master and they are giving the output. The end output is always unknown to the slave nodes. Their responsibility is to receive the tasks and provide the tasks output to the master. How it relates to the application is not, I mean, visible from the slave node level. So we, uh, we saw one principle, I mean, of designing the Hadoop is to access the data locally with the code that we like to run. So here, I mean, for example, users give a file and, and define what needs to be done with the file. I mean, the logics. So the logics will be transferred to a particular slam dot one and two and n. And then these nodes are also thinking about working as a data node of a SDFS. Ideally, it should be the same node. So those files which have been put in the SDFS is already distributed in multiple data nodes. So whenever there is a jobs coming, I mean the programs coming, which needs to be executed on top of some data or a file which is stored in SDFS, the tags will be created in such a way so that the tags will run on the locally stored data of the file so that there is an efficiency ensured in this process. So this will be done, I mean, in the under the hood so that the assigned tags on the slave node will run on the file blocks particular a section which is stored in the data node and we know the data node one and the slave node one here is this is the same way and in the in the slave node one basically data node one is part of the same SDFS cluster 
and the tax taker is running also here. So the assigned tax will run on the locally available blocks of the file and return the result to the job tracker. So this is, I mean, the way the master and slave communicates. So what wrongs, I mean, in these designs, what, what more we need to, I mean, uh, discuss is the failure possibilities. I mean, the master is receiving the job while processing the job. It can assign, I mean, multiple slave nodes. So whenever, let's say, one job is assigned to the slave node one, slave node ones can process a job inefficiently, right? I mean, it can take a lot of times. So there is a timeout has to be set on job tracker for a particular tax tracker, how much time the job tracker will wait to get a response. It is required to be implemented because a slave node can be inefficient to process a query. Or while assigning a job from master to slave node, a slave node, particular node is not accessible. It's an exceptional scenario because every time these slave nodes are communicating with master node, whether he is available or not. But still, if due to some network interruptions or other issues, if the self node status is unknown, the master will still try to, I mean, communicate to slab node, and they will try to assign a job. If it's not found, then it will not give that particular task to slab node one, which is faulty. It will transfer to the other nodes. So whether the slave nodes is receive the tax and it is creating delay and then it's down or it is not able to even receive the tax. So in all the levels, so the job taker will have functionality implemented to overcome all the failures. And similarly for master also. So we can configure a secondary master, but at a time in a cluster, there will be one master. If something goes wrong, if we implement the clustering mechanism, then the cluster will shift to the secondary master. So this is the way, I mean, one specific job can be divided into multiple level and assigned to slave nodes. And those slave nodes will do their job, send it to master and it will reduce, I mean, the combine or aggregate and the result will be given to the applications. So yet I understand, I mean, there are confusions, I mean, how it works. So we'll see multiple examples to understand uh, within practical uh, problem statement, small problem statement. So for example, the we have a file which is uh, here shown as add.txt and there are a lot of names of participants. It's randomly collected from our participation li participant list. So this file initially I would like to ask, I mean, is storing some names separated by space and lines. So this is a structured, unstructured, or semi-structured. What type, I mean, it, it falls under. You can write your response. Is it structured, unstructured, or semi-structured? Yes, so it is unstructured. So there is no structure. It's a TXT file. Some are having, I mean, four or five names. Some are having three names, four names. So, so it is totally unstructured. 
to understand MapReduce algorithm. So always it is better to start with the word count problem and it's very traditional way to understand MapReduce. So I'm also going the same way. I'm not, uh, uh, not try, I'm not trying to bring any new problem statement. So this is the common problem statement which has been used since long to understand MapReduce algorithm. So now what is the problem? Do you understand? I mean, we need to understand, we need to find out the unique words and their occurrence. That's the, that is the problem. I mean, our first word is Nabil. If there is more occurrences, we need to just find that occurrence. Let's say in this TXT file, Nabil has been found for two times. So the output will be Nabil is found as two times. So that's the output. And then Onu, let's say we find him only two times. So Onu comma two, that, that will be one of the part of the answer. So we'll find all the unique words and their occurrence. That's our problem statement. So before going to distributed computing, if we need to implement using Zava, Python, or whatever language in a traditional method, how it should be implemented? I mean, what's the efficient algorithm? So I will try to explain, and, and you can do some homework. I mean, I know in last class I told you, I mean, we'll continue with the with Python in this course. So you can, you can implement this traditional method using Python. So for example, uh, if, we, if we write a Python code that will read the first line of the TXT file and we, we started reading all the words. Hope, I mean, all can read a file and identify words in each line. So we read the first word, which is Nabil. I don't know Nabil joined or not today. Okay, so we find Nabil one single reference. And in our bucket, we don't have Nabil yet, right? So that's why we put Nabil one. And then the next word, and the next word, we don't have in our bucket and that's why we are putting one, one, one. In the second line, we start repeating. Third line, we are doing the same. Fourth line, we are doing the same. All these words are unique. That's why you're putting a one, one, one. Fifth line, same. Sixth line. In seventh line, we see John and we have already John in our bucket. So when I say bucket, you can implement dictionary. Dictionary is a data type in Python, so you can implement this in a dictionary and, and you can increase this value for John because we find John as a second occurrence, Kevin second occurrence and all other also second. This is the way we can compete for eighth, ninth, and tenth line. So the now result will be some of the names will be found as one, some of the mains are found as two. So that is the result, right? So this is the way, I mean, a traditional program or method can efficiently find out the word, unique words and their occurrence. So there are many other methods you can think of. I mean, calculating or identifying unique word and their occurrence, but this is one of the efficient way that has been used for traditional purpose. Now, what happened the file size, these, a, a single file size 100 GB of all the names into it. How much time it will take to process it. 
if we need to if we need to count unique words and then their count can you think of i mean how much time you would need just to process a 100 gigabyte file just to solve this simple problem it will take a lot of time the ones needs to calculate because this is a txt file and all are ascii characters so 100 gb means there will be a lot of lines in words it not required these names to be within a single file the problem statement can be different i mean the problem is same that the file can be let's say we need to search 10000 files and in the 10000 file there will be words like this and we need to find out from all the files the unique word names and their occurrence because one can question me in a file, in a single file, how it can be 100 GB. So the technique will be same, but if we need to go in a sequential manner, how long it will take. And that's how we need to use the distributing computing framework, MapReduce, to, to ensure parallel process of the machines and get a faster result. Let's see how, if we need to process, or if we need to build an own MapReduce framework, how we'll build. I mean, if, if I need to build a one as part of my undergraduate research, I would build like this way, for only for this problem. So if, if some of the students, I mean, if you have completed your networking course and you are from computer science, you will understand. And I understand the, from the professional who joined here, so they will understand very well. So let's say this problem, only this problem, word count problem. The problem pattern can be many types. So the word count is a sample because the input file can be binary, it can be video, it can be HTML, can be XML, and what we are trying to do can be different. Let's say the problem here can be different. We need to identify the first word or first letter of a word, and then try to identify the unique names who are start with the common letters. So then for Nabil, we'll create n comma one. For Mehdi, we'll create m comma one. And this is the way it, it will run. So the problem statement can be changed anytime, depending on the business requirement. But for the sake of the simplicity, if we consider, if we want to consider, we will have a lot of files or a single file having names and we'll count word how we'll build in a distributed fashion. That's what we are discussing here. So we are not going into yet the MapReduce framework. So let's say we'll create one master. This is one operating system. And there are three, this should be slave nodes, it's a typo. So slave nodes one, two, and three. So some other operating system, I mean, running here, it can be same. So I would run one specific process to receive the user's inputs. So the, let's say we are running a process which is listening mode in 65005 port, and it will receive a txt file or more txt files in the same manner and we know what we need to do so that instruction is not given or is it does not need to be given explicitly because we know what we are trying to solve is what count problem only one problem so whenever we received a one file or multiple file what the master will do 
it will read each line and it will assign each line first line to let's say slave node one second line to slave node two third line to three and similarly fourth line to slave node one again i'm in the round robin fashion so it will split and it will send each line to the slave nodes how using a specific port that is being listened into all the slave nodes and the port is 65001 so it will connect to a socket create a connections and it will write it into the slave node what the slave nodes will do it will get all these lines and it will it will implement that specific function and find out in a specific line that what is the word count and after getting the result, it will turn back the output to the master. And master have now all the lines pair. And the master will aggregate all this pair and result will be given to an user. So this is the way, I mean, if we have a 100 GB, one file or multiple files, in an amateur way, we can design a solution like this. But what MapReduce will do, the problem statement, what we are trying to write here, it's fixed code in masters and slave nodes. I mean, in master, we are splitting by line and slave nodes, it is getting a line, it is identifying a word and counting it within a line. And here, when it's getting back, it is, I mean, aggregating and giving results. But in MapReduce framework, what you are trying to do that you can define while assigning to a master node. I mean, the map and reduce, you will write. So we'll see, I mean, in our practical sessions, not today, maybe some days later, we'll see how we'll write our own map reduce function while assigning the job to the master. So that the problem, what we are trying to solve is always in the hand in the client side. And based on the that, the master will act and the slaves will work according to the master instruction. So here, this is one problem. The problem is fixed here. Another problem is we don't implement any failure scenarios. When we assign a slave node, a job, what is the job I mean, task, the task status, if something goes wrong, any particular slave nodes, what will happen? So all these failure scenarios, we have not been implemented, which is implemented in the MapReduce framework. So now, I think if we move forward to the actual MapReduce framework, how it, how it works, that will be more clear to you. So yes, we understand problem description is fixed because it's already hard coded in master and slave, how it will work. Map and reduce function is not received from the user. This is one problem here, but still it is a distributed fashion, right? So we can implement like this. What if one slave node is down? Yes, the failure scenarios are not being captured, but yes, we can still capture in the master node. What if, if one slave node is taking exceptional time to process? The slave node is not down. When you say ping or when you say some hello, it is responding, but it is not responding your specific tax output. That can be a scenario because maybe the OS is having some problem. The data node is having some problem, which is not, I mean, which is creating problem to process or getting access to the data. It can be many scenarios or some other user is running some other application within the same OS. So that's why the, it's taking exceptional amount of time. So we need to create one timeout. I mean, then we need to cancel or reject that task before reassigning that particular task to slave node because when it finished, it will again respond it with the task, right? And if you cannot identify that this is a fatal task, which output I should discard, 
then it otherwise it will create i mean problem for the user maybe it create wrong output it may create so these are the problems and these are the limitations that we have not considered in our own map reduce i mean own distributed computing way to solve word count problem now let's see how all this problem is being taken care in the actual map reduce framework so i am not truly going through all this theory you can go by yourself later on i mean when we share this material let's i mean focus on here so you see the here we have two input files and the input files we have written some fruits name right apple orange i don't know what you like so whenever these input files for the same word count problem is submitted to the the master nodes of map reduce so each line pass to individual mapper instance the apple one orange one so these we call in standard way key value pairs if you work with i mean json data everybody knows i mean what is key value pair right and this after i mean map key value splitting so internally it will do a short and shuffle all the apples are grouped together in one grapes in one mango orange and plum and then based on the keys we are now reducing apple 4 grapes 1 mango 2 orange 2 plum 3 and the final output is like this so i may produce job usually splits the input data set into independent chunks which are processed by the map tax in a complete parallel manner the framework sorts the output of the maps which are then input to the reduce tax typically both the input and output of the job are stored on a file system the framework takes care of scheduling tax and reexecuting the failed tax so this is this is more mature way i mean how the mapping and the reduce tax is happening and how the final result is coming and the map reduce framework is having i mean we know that there are two processes one is job tracker and the tax tracker the job tracker uh, will create all these maps and will be distributing the jobs will a single maps job to all the slave node and then when the slaves are giving the output to the slave node then it will it is basically sorting shuffling and then reducing key value pairs and the output has been given to the application users but here the key function is i mean we can the user can define the map functions so here what is the map function so we are splitting by line per line we are identifying word and count per line so this is our mapping function and reduce is per key value we are aggregating it and that's the result so while doing this assignment if there is something wrong in a slave node that can be addressed by a timeout period and that task can be reassigned to other slave nodes so the job tracker will 
will be managing all the tags and the tag status. If something goes wrong in a particular slave nodes. So here we discussed earlier, I think three common problem. The problem description is fixed, but here as user can write their own map problem and the reduce problem. So, so it's not fixed. So it's open for user. That's why it's framework. So you will write your own how the map and reduce will work and the failure scenarios of the slate nodes is covered. And for the master one, you need to implement the clustering techniques. But if it's not required, then uh, you need to rely if something goes on master, then everything will be gone. So all the problems are basically resolved in the map reduce algorithms. So we'll, we'll see also in a practical way in upcoming class, how it will work. And then you can, I mean, more correlate how it actually work. But we, we will write this map reduce uh examples very less but we'll see how an sql statement can be converted to map reduce because for every problem we have converting it to map reduce is challenging for any programmer so that's why the there are a lot of techniques has been evolved for example, we'll use Spark, Apache Spark as a distributed computing framework in our course. And there we'll see how a Spark SQL can run and internally it will convert to my produce job so that it can be parallelized in multiple machines. So as a programmer, you don't need to understand the detail or write the map and reduce function, it will be automatically written by the framework. So this work on problem. So if we if we want to, uh, these these names are are stored in a in a structured data. Let's say in a database. So one column can be named, and and another column can be count. So if the table name is X, then we can really create one SQL uh, let's say we can write in statement like select I should write here select name count from X group by name, right? So, and if our table structure is like this, so we have name here and for example, count. So Nabil one, Mehedi one, right? Let's say this is one structure. From there, we would like to say, we'd like to output the unique names and their counts. We can do like this, select names and count from X group by. But if you if you'd like to, I mean, uh, create one map reduce job, it will be like this. So you need to uh, read line by line, assigning job to the slave, and in the map function you will you will write how to, I mean, count unique word and their counts. So this is the way how we need to write is map reduce, and in the SQL you see you see it's very simple. So that's why I mean lot of open source contributors, they are developing the easy way so that uh, because the SQLs are being, I mean, taught by in, in university or, and we are all familiar with that. 
so that whenever we run this one in Spark SQL, we'll see how internally it will get converted. But if anyone is very expert on the map reduce, so they can still write map and reduce function and assign jobs to uh, map reduce framework, it will run. So that's all I mean for uh, today. Hi, Ibrahim. I mean, we can uh, move forward to the questions and answer session. Okay. Almost 28 questions. Okay. Okay, would you please publish the question answer? I mean, previous and future in the website, some of them are really helpful. We have no way using them once the video session is over. So I would like to, yeah. yeah uh, already my uh, previous my, uh, first class question answers already in the video. So if anyone uh, just listen the answer uh, at the end of video, he can find. Thank you, thank you Ibrahim, that's helpful. Can you give us instruction to set up our environment of the course? Uh, which version is 10 to a 7? I told earlier. Okay. Uh, what does it mean by commodity machine? So the commodity machine, I mean, uh, it can be a server, but uh, should not be having the redundancy in DIX level, RAM level, but it should have certain amount of resources. CPU, RAM. Let's say, uh, in many state of the art machines, it has redundancy in the DIX level, the physically it, it's been grade one, right? So it does not require any Hadoop cluster, but if it's there, it's good. So it should be inexpensive machines complying with the requirement that is, I mean, shared in the last course, last class. So, okay, the how Google uses SDFS in the GGC. Okay, sorry, but it's not part of our class. But if you want to read some Google uh, research paper that I can share with you. Uh, could you describe what is NoSQL and big data and what is the difference between Hadoop and MongoDB? Okay. So, so these are two different things, right? I mean, the no SQL. So the no SQL is, so I mean, we talked about the Hadoop ecosystem there, you will see the ACE base, right? So this is a no SQL database. I mean, we can run some specific queries on top of those no SQL. No SQL is preferable when you have to handle the unstructured data set. For example, if you need to store multiple files having a lot of words and lines, right? So, and, and if you create one NoSQL table and in a specific table, it can have, in each row, it can have multiple amount of, I mean, columns. So what, in RDMS, what is happening? So, in RDMS, if we create a schema, I mean, let's say it has three columns. So in each row, we'll have three columns. But in NoSQL DB, if you create one table, and in NoSQL we call this collection, in a collection, you may create, I mean, uh, three column initially, but you can insert 
a row which can have 100 columns. So that is the way it works. So it's, it's mainly built for uh, unstructured data, to handle the unstructured data, but you can still store uh, structured data. And as you are referring for MongoDB, is MongoDB is, is very, uh, its response rate is very fast. In many structured application, structured data related applications also nowadays we are using MongoDB. But before using MongoDB, the developer has to know the queries details because it's not like SQL, but it's similar like SQL. And it and and and, and it, it does not does not necessarily that MongoDB is running on a big data. Uh, it can run on a I mean Linux machine, right? And it can run a traditional uh, database, right? But but supports handling large amount of data as well. In general, what is the ratio of name node and data node for the efficient optimum management? The minimum, I mean, we need to have three nodes at least. So within the three nodes, in first node, we can run name node. And the other nodes, we can run, I mean, data nodes, and we can set replication factor equal to two. It's minimum. But production for production it is recommended that you use at least four nodes and the application factor should be three. Is there any documentation how to configure CentOS operating system hosted? Uh, yes, I mean, there is no specific documentation, but that's how I would recommend you to set up after, I mean, the uh, next class. So, so I, I will try to share, I mean, through this uh, forum, I mean, how to do that so that you can do some practice. What is the heartbeat in the, in the architecture? Yes, I mean, uh, the heartbeat is being managed between name node and data node, if you talk about the SDFS, and they communicate with a certain protocol. So if the heartbeat is not been found, then the name node will consider the data node is not responding. So it has been implemented within their own protocol. Can you explain again the read operation? Okay. I think we have some time. We can just go through the read operation. So, Let's say we have that file add.txt with all the names of the participants have kept in uh, SDFS. So we know, I mean, uh, this file size is very low. It is, uh, it should be captured within a single block. And if the replication factor is two, that means these blocks are being stored in either of the data node. So the files block information is already with the SDFS. Whenever the SDFS client is requested to access that add.txt, so it will create internally an open system call to SDFS with the file name. Then SDFS will see in its, I mean, FS image, right? We know FS image and edit log. There are two, uh, I mean, files where it is tracking all these important metadata, and it will see first the file is available or not because you need to specify the whole full path of the file. In that particular path that you have mentioned, it will see whether the file is available and you have the access permission to read that file. If everything is okay, then SDFS will ask the name node to send this block location. And then the SDFS will request to name nodes that please give me the block and adds this one block, it will be returned from a specific data node and it will be sent to the SDFS client. So this is basically a SDFS request. 
if you have further question i mean after the question and answer session you can raise your hand and we can discuss what command should we learn to use centos linux distribution okay i will try to share i mean some command syntax so we have a lab environment and uh, we'll see i mean how we can share we need to discuss with ibrahim so so we'll share maybe in a lab environment so that you can you can just do an sftp and get the uh, files but but for the time being what i said i mean the centos centos linux i mean do some study if you google if you see how to i mean find the files i mean read the files how to write a new file all the stuff is sufficient for the time being and use uh, how to use the beam command beam and bi that would be great and i i'm coming back with some formal documentations what is the difference between data block and data node so so the data nodes is uh, something that uh, for example we have our own laptop right so we are running one operating system is windows or mac or linux or ubuntu so on that if we install a specific process data node in that case we are seeing a data node is running on that particular machine but data block is something different whenever the users is uh, i mean trying to put a file that file is being separated with multiple blocks if it is more than the basic block size that a dfs is configured so if we are keeping let's say our sdfs block size is 64 megabyte and we are keeping a file which is less than 64 megabyte then the data block will be a single data block and the data node on which machine we are storing those blocks so i hope i i i made clarify i mean question why user need to write in log file i i don't get your question i mean uh, exactly but i mean if you if you mention if you try to mention about the edit log edit log is not something that user is accessing so it is fully internal with the sdfs process and it's related to the name node so it will uh it will keep the the file changes patterns and everything Uh, in that file i mean let's say when one file is being accessed last time or being updated last time all those information you will get please tell something about the process of dfs output system okay so there are i mean it's related to i mean whenever there is a write operation right so the write operation let's say being requested from a host operating system or from a program externally so that will be dealing with fs output system but whenever we are dealing with internally with uh sdfs then we will be using dfs output stream from data node to name node so this is totally i mean internal to the hadoop systems i i try to i mean explain in a high level is there any solution to node redundancy for hadoop nodes for the later version of the hadoop uh, i i think you are mentioning about name node so as i said apache i mean hadoop version after hadoop version 2 or something you will you can implement uh, the redundancy of the name node and but you need to implement the clustering technique which is not coming with the by default hadoop binaries so you need to configure the way i mean the apache is recommending to configure let's say secondary name nodes as an active standby mode so that it can take over in case of any active name node failure 
how is the replication factor identified is it based on the size of the file no i mean the replication factor is is standard i mean is for a medium cluster it is recommended two but uh, it is always uh, recommended to be three because i mean if you increase the replication factor you can understand how uh, the processing capacity we need to increase and how we need to create duplicate blocks uh, across the cluster so one block is written three when one block is written five times four times six times it will increase your cost and it will it will reduce your usable disk space and also the processing time so it's a complex calculation and that's why i mean we need to follow the standard being suggested by the open source forum and that the replication factor is generally followed i mean three so if we increase that one definitely the high ability will increase but we, we need to consider the other around the flip side also i mean the processing power has to be increased and the response time writing a file to the user it will be also increased because we need to write a lot of blocks more to ensure the high ability what is affected if we continue the name node and data node in the same machine if we have adequate resources i mean yes we can still run i said that we can run name node and data node in the same machine but uh, for a production instance i mean either you you apply the clustering mechanism of name node by following apache guideline or by your own in house tool that doesn't matter so in case to ensure that name node redundancy is better to split data node from there how the node selection is done by sdfs when to write in which data node so i talk about the i mean the uh, hadoop balance mechanism right so uh, it in, in maintenance you need to give sometimes i mean see the data node capacity and all this consumption and and run this command so that the sdfs sdfs is automatically i mean checking through name node processes i mean how much data blocks is being consumed and what data nodes it it will try to automatically balance that but it's not due to some reason i mean in maintenance we can run hadoop balance command to balance the blocks which will trigger rebalancing in the whole cluster and you you ask the how because the name node the master node it it knows right i mean what blocks is being kept by what data node it's already known and knows how it has been occupied so it can balance technically if median file size greater than node size by 2 will it make the node size unless since next file won't fit in the node sizing is based on type of data uh, more more like file size so sizing is based on type of data mm. i am not sure i mean i get your question or not because the data type can be any type right the structure and the structure or non structure but i mean will it make the node size useless since next file won't fit in the in the node so i'm not getting your question so maybe if you raise your hand we can discuss later but uh, but it's not required the sizing should be done based on the file type ideally name mode functions are like master in the nodes yes right because in the same design under hadoop we have uh, i mean two component sdfs and uh, map reduce so and there when we are saying is a it is uh, 
name node is part of SDFS when we are saying is a master node is part of then the MapReduce master node. What is the ideal percentage need to be free for SDFS sizing? Okay, so you are saying that, I mean, within a DIX, how much we need to, I mean, keep for non-HDFS data. So it depends, basically. So, I mean, uh, for example, if you are installing uh, a CentOS. So in the CentOS, we have a minimum guideline that we need to keep a minimum space for that, right? So after that, if you need to utilize all the space for SDFS you can use if you are not using any MapReduce job on top of that. If you are using some MapReduce job, you need to keep some, I mean, file system space for the MapReduce job. Is there any process to assign the replicas of the data file to select a specific data node? Hmm, no, I, it's, it's been managed by under the hood. So, so the Hadoop, uh, the HDFS name of demon process we decide, I mean, uh, but yes, we can still run the balance command so that it can balance while keeping the blocks. I am not sure it can be controlled by any command line or not. How to edit file uh, you did not mention, we'll see. We'll see in the practical session, are you taking the lowest number to calculate? Are we taking the lowest number to calculate it? Don't get your question, frankly. What will be if one or two of the slave nodes is down? Is the slave node mandatory or it will work by master node? So, of course, the slave nodes are mandatory because the slave nodes will run the tax. Master node will not run the tax. It will assign the tax to slave node. So if uh, one or more slave nodes are down, uh, still some slave nodes are up, still the job uh, tracker running the master node will try to, I mean, perform the job. But you understand there might be delay finishing the job. Demonstrate practical classes in container environment. Yes, it's possible, but I will use, I mean, we, we are given with some lab environment. So I can use CentOS uh, directly there. So we have some VMs assigned for this lab. So I'm not going to use any container. Map reduce technique is good, yes, but uh, implementing map and reduce is complex for generic, I mean, understanding. Understanding is, is good with some problem, but when the problems are getting complex, and in that case, implementing map and reduce is tough, so that's why uh, it's better to use some other alternate techniques which will under the hood create the map reduce and assign the job. We'll see next if if is data size more than one GB, how many storage location created? If the data size more than one GB, how many storage location? So it depends on the block size. I thought you were asking about a particular file which is one GB. Then if the Hadoop block size is, let's say, uh, 128 MB, then it will split all this uh, the user data and try to store. So how many storage location created? Okay, so that depends on the replication factor. Send to as details, okay. I answered already. Why user need to write on log files? I think I answered. Could you give me one real world example? Right, once, read many. Uh, it's uh, it's kind of indexing the, I mean the uh, websites. So most of the case, I mean it's uh, the cool what they are doing. I mean they are uh, keeping 
all the websites uh, in their GFS system. And if there is any updates, they are appending, rather rewriting on the same file. So this is the this is one example I can give you. Can you please describe some more about the relationship between MapReduce and HDFS? So I already described, I think the MapReduce is a distributed computing framework, meaning you want to, I mean, execute something. You want to get some job done. But HDFS is something else. You want to store something in a distributed fashion. So that if something goes wrong, you still get your data. So two things are really different. One is storage, one is uh, distributed uh, computing or processing. But it has been managed uh, and designed to work together. That's how, I mean, if we have one name node and multiple data nodes, and when you want to run some jobs, in that case, name nodes become master and data nodes become slaves. And that will give us the flexibility to run the logics locally on the data, stored on the data node. That's the relation, basically. Option CentOS, I think I explained what is the importance of using rack in data nodes in case of big data. I mean, rack is, I mean, what I mean in the data center, we have rack and the rack we generally install or mount the servers, right? So, so anyway, the, your name node or data node has to be run uh, on some physical machine and those physical machine has to be on the rack, right? Because you need to powered up is there a limitation in data size of Hadoop to process? Still not known because the everyday data is increasing and it's been, I mean, processed by the Hadoop. Stall seven is worked fine, thank you. Okay. Can you please repeat the list uh, data node memory part? How did the calculation end up with 28 GB? Okay. Let me go back. So it's memory calculation. So data node, uh, so four into four, it's meaning we, if we have, I mean, four CPU core, each CPU core, we should keep at least four GB. So here we are getting 16. And data node core processing memory is four and the OS four and, and then, okay. Okay. And we, if we are running MapReduce, then four. So this is the way it's coming, I mean, 28. It's four, eight, 12, 12 into 16, 28. But I'm saying if you are not using MapReduce, I mean Hadoop MapReduce, then you can leave this for, then it will be around 24. Have any reference book to understand more about big data and Hadoop? Yeah, you can just go through my reference always. In the reference, there are a lot of, I mean, online tutorials and more. Uh, so you can read those. You will have more ideas on, from there. As SDFS has its own data redundancy system, then do we need RAID? No, that's a good question because uh, this RAID can be soft RAID or hardware RAID. All these things we are managing on the SDFS level. Uh, we don't need any RAID system here. Okay, to install CentOS and Windows using VMware, could it cause any problem later? No, you can CentOS, uh, you can run on VMware very well, no problem. And that's how, I mean, a uh, student should do it. Uh, uh, give us reference book, or reference, just see the reference in my material. So let me show you again now. So every material you will find reference. Uh, because we are, frankly speaking, busy people. So before, I mean, creating material. So if I take help from some of the 
reference I always mention in my slides. So you can go through all this. These links are very helpful. You may get more details about all this topic here. Hi, Ibrahim. I think I covered all the questions. I mean, if now anyone has any concern, then they can, I mean, pick up hands and we can discuss.